today's Daniel will uh, introduce our speaker. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. So let me just briefly introduce Martin Schlecker, so as most of you know Martin. Uh, Martin uh, started at the beginning, he did his uh, bachelor's work at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial uh, Physics in Garshin and then moved to DLR, the German Space Agency, to do an internship there. He got his Master's of Science at ESO, he worked there uh, at uh, the European Southern Observatory and then uh, a PhD in 2021 from the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy. Uh, after that, he moved uh, to uh, University of Arizona, joined our Alien Earth team, where he has been doing very exciting research on the interface of exoplanet observations and planet formation. So in his, he has written influential papers uh, on cutting-edge observational methods, including discovery of radio velocity detected planets, and worked on reconciling the observations and these discoveries with uh, planet formation models such as core accretion and pebble accretion and figuring out how exoplanet demographics uh, can shape our understanding of plant formation and vice versa. And so uh, he has worked, in addition to the research he will be presenting today, he has also played important roles in our project EDA and exoplanet, uh, transiting exoplanet search, and then also helped, with, uh, helped save the planet with uh, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, <laughs> and he's working on a project very intense to do that. And so his, his work, what he will be presenting today, we'll probably be mostly focusing on uh, understanding what are the science questions uh, that we future next generation space missions can uh, help us answer, especially about the habitable zone and how we can use basically bioverse and similar uh, approaches to understand how to best optimize uh, future space missions. So Martin, take it away. Thank you, thank you very much uh, all for coming and Daniel for the very nice introduction. So indeed, as uh, Daniel has already hinted at, I uh, focus since I moved to the UFA on uh, how the hab habitability of individual planets can be statistically interpreted uh, by combining data that we have on individual planets with uh, information or context on the planet population as a whole. Uh, and before that, in my PhD, as Daniel also mentioned already, was a bit more about planet formation models, what they produce, and what are the differences between planet formation models and what the exoplanet demographics tell us. And today, I'm a bit excited to try this. I want to try this for the first time to combine these two approaches and focus a bit on the, on the questions at the interface, what, what happens or what can we learn if we try to combine these two approaches, planet population synthesis, and um, exoplanet demographics and hypothesis testing on um, uh, population level um, patterns, right? So if my slides advance, I can actually show you something that most of you might be familiar with. But um, so this is about the concept, a, a very old concept. I didn't know, in fact, how old it is. but. This is about the habitable zone, and when I did some research, I found that already Isaac Newton in the 1600s referred to something that, to me, sounds a lot like our habitable zone concept, right? Our water, if the Earth were located in the orbit of Saturn, would be frozen. If in the orbit of Mercury, it would depart at once into vapor. So he even predicted the steam atmospheres that we're uh, dealing with when we think about runaway greenhouse planets. Uh, you know, planets are closer than this habitable zone. Um, so that was a bit, bit surprising to me, of course. Uh, nowadays, we have a bit more refined concepts of this habitable zone. Um, but um, as you see in this plot, and you have seen it in similar forms before, I guess, uh, this is semi-major axis of planets uh, versus their um, the stellar effective temperature of the host star that they orbit. Um, and in green, of course, is that habitable zone, which um, basically defines where a sustained liquid body of water um, would be possible on an Earth-like planet. So we know that this is an oversimplification, of course. If we're looking for life, life needs a bit more than that. We need energy, chemistry, we need an atmosphere. We need water in the first place, right? But this habitable zone concept guides our search, and uh, it has been helpful in the past. And so maybe just first two takeaways already that most discovered planets, and these are Kepler planets here, the scattered points, are actually closer than the habitable zone, they're in hotter regimes. And uh, the position of that habitable zone in this parameter space depends on the spectral type of the host star. 
So the Alien Earths program, which I'm also part of and which funds this research, centers on that question, right? Which nearby planetary systems are likely to host habitable worlds or even life? And in order to figure out which planets might be habitable, some fundamental parameters can be measured, but others cannot. So we need context, right? Contextual information that might render an otherwise habitable planet or Earth-like planet actually inhabitable. And one major goal to inform future uh, design or the strategy of future exoplanet missions uh, is to, of course, maximize the scientific value. And for missions focusing on habitability, we need to think about how to do that. So these missions will be successful if, um, if we're able to answer the question, what is the diagnostic power of a survey as a function of the targets we select, the kind of data we collect, and any you know, auxiliary information that we might have about the, the systems that we study or the planet population as a whole. So we need some context. And I, I want to focus on that contextual information that we can use to inform exoplanet missions. So what I'd like to do is discuss this by means of two approaches. Again, population synthesis and planet formation model approach. Um, have a look at how this compares to the measured exoplanet demographics as well, but then also in the second part, quantifying a mission's ability to test a specific hypothesis. Yeah. So what kind of context do we have here when we compare formation models with exoplanet population? Of course, this is what we usually do. We try to fit the two together and often it doesn't work as well. Um, but we can, we can look at different things. We can look at the occurrence rates of specific planet types in the synthetic populations and in the observed ones. We can uh, not only focus on individual planets and place them in parameter space, but we can look at the context on a system level, like what other planets are in the system, how might they influence the resulting like planet properties, but also their habitability. And then one thing I, I, I want to focus on today in particular is M dwarf systems, because just as a reminder, again, this plot, um, there is a dependency on the spectral type and um, in, in particular with the exoplanet detection techniques that we're mostly using nowadays, transits and radio velocities, the very strong orbital distance um, dependency of their sensitivity and so most of the planets that get close to or are, or are in this habitable zone actually orbit M dwarfs. So that's why I would like to focus more on these systems. One observational sample that we have comes from the Carmenes instrument and survey. So it's both a, a spectrograph, high precision spectrograph, and a survey that we conducted to detect uh, planets orbiting M dwarfs. The um, guaranteed time observations are finished now, where we focused on more than 300 M dwarf targets and discovered up to now 33 new planets and confirmed a lot of planets that were initially detected by a transit, mostly from the test mission. Um, so it's been quite successful. And if we, if we look at their whole star mass distribution, it's mostly between 0.25 solar masses and 0.65 solar masses. This is also you know, the bulk of the initial sample that was chosen for, for various reasons. Uh, and what's interesting is below this, so for the very low mass stars, the late M dwarfs, uh, half of the planets around these coasts have actually been discovered by Carmenes. So um, we, we learned a lot of new things. Uh, in particular, there were some surprises too when we looked at that population in particular. For example, if you look at the stellar host mass versus the minimum mass of the planets, um, then you'll see that there are also some giant planets in this sample. Giant planets around you know, mid M dwarfs, but also around the late M dwarfs, and that really came as a surprise because planet formation um, models didn't predict any giant planets in this parameter range. So the central question that um, we wanted to answer is that um, if, or yeah, was if planet formation theory um, can reproduce these observed 
planet populations and can reproduce it as a function of stellar host mass. So we need a planet formation model. And fortunately, my PhD advisors had one. So uh, a super quick recap on, well, first on the core accretion theory in general, and then on well, what's in our model. Uh, just in a nutshell, core accretion assumes that you first accrete a solid core by accreting planetesimals and also smaller particles. Often you will hear the term, the term pebbles. It's just a, a, yeah, it's a different size and different dynamics happen, but uh, the, the main point is that you accrete the solids first, and then once this core is massive enough, you may accrete an atmosphere. Depending on how efficiently you can do this, the planet ends up as a terrestrial-sized rocky planet um, or a gas giant. And typically this happens at several locations in a protoplanetary disk and not just once, so we end up with systems of planets. And of course, once they grow to specific masses or, or sufficient masses, they will interact with that surrounding gas and dust, and that leads to planet migration. So the planets uh, change their orbits depending on how they interact with the disk. And in most cases, that actually leads to shrinking orbits. So the planets move closer to the host star, and they, where we, when we detect them, this is usually not where we think that they have formed. So the problem with all this is that basically none of this can be directly observed. So <laughs> what do we do? Um, of course, we, we try to close that gap. And uh, this is why we run these, these global simulations where you take a gas disk and properties that we hope we understood, we squeeze all the physics that we think we understand in there, and then we see what comes out in the end. In the end, of course, we have as an end product planetary system, which again, uh, we can compare to observations. We have disk observations, we have planet detections, and we're trying to figure out what happens in between. So that's the whole concept of planet population synthesis, basically. Um, and the model that I've been using, uh, mostly during my PhD, is sometimes called the Baron model. Um, a really brief overview, just what's included there. We have the evolution of a viscous accretion disk, um, this includes photo evaporation of that disk, so at some point the gas disappears due to the radiation from the host star, but also giant stars that might be close by. And we have uh, planetesimal and gas accretion uh, simultaneously on up to 50, sometimes even 100 embryos that uh, where we also keep track of what these planets accrete from their disk. Uh, we solve the interior structure equation, which is um, very important for the, um, to determine the gas accretion rate, but also the, the final uh, radii, uh, for example, of, an, of a gas giant planet. So there's an evolution part as well. We don't stop when the disk disappears. And of course, orbit migration is important and end-body interaction between planets as well. This really defines the final system architecture. This is quite expensive part of the model, but we cannot do without it because the result is really very different. And then since relatively recently, um, we also take into account different spectral types of the whole star. Um, yeah, so if you want to know more about this, I encourage you to check out Remo's talk, Remo Bon gave an origins talk a few months ago, um, and he can go more into the details of how we scale disk masses and inner edges and luminosity evolution of the star and all that stuff. So I would like to come back quickly to the observed sample, right? We want to compare it with our observed sample and Carminus is one good sample for n dwarfs, but there's another big radio velocity survey and that's the n dwarf subsample from Hart. Uh, and since we had good access to both and auxiliary data of both um, surveys, we combined the two and kind of kind of stitched together a virtual heart and carbonous survey, um, where in the end, you know, once you accounted for duplicates and, and removed stars that were only observed a couple of times and would distort the, uh, the sample, uh, in the end we have 148 good stars and they host 35 planets. And since we also had the, uh, the raw radio velocity measurements, uh, from these surveys, we could characterize the detection biases, which is very important because we know there are strong biases in the observations. 
and we don't have these biases in the planet formation models, of course. It just produce what they produce, whatever forms, and we want to compare apples with apples. Um, so what we did was we injected planetary signals in the raw radio velocity measurements, um, and then you get such sensitivity maps, right? So this is uh, for different stellar mass spins uh, in orbital period versus minimum mass, the, the probability that you would detect that planet that lives in a in the region of that parameter space. And uh, before we apply this to the simulated planets, this is what we get when we don't do this, when we just look at what comes out. Again, orbital period and minimum mass, um, and this is what the M dwarf uh, Bern model um, gave us as a population. So a lot of system and systems and more than two million uh, planets that we can look at, and this is the occurrence rate density in minimum mass orbital period. So you see that we mostly produce small mass planets um, and uh, 100 days orbital periods. And we have the first question. Yes, Sebastian. Is this already averaged stuff for different stellar masses, or is this for a particular stellar mass? Oh, good point. Yeah, I should have mentioned this. Here, we assume the stellar mass distribution of that combined Harps and Carmenas surveys. We did the same in the simulations uh, to, yeah take this into account, the stellar mass dependency. And this is the overall sample. So the, the stellar masses are distributed like in the observed sample, and this is what you get in total. Um, and we're going to split this up in stellar mass spins in a minute, because it's, that's where things don't fit anymore. <laughs> but here, everything looks good. And once we apply the detection bias of Harps and Carmenas, a lot of these planets disappear. Most of them, in fact, by far. We end up with 20,000 planets that we can look at, and they are, there are a few giant planets as well, you know, but mostly we have super Earth on short orbits. This is where, where basically the main cluster of planets ends up, and this is also where most of the observed planets reside. They cluster here as well, orbits, orbits of tens, and, tens of days and days, and mostly super Earth. Uh, so if you look at this, you might think there is a relatively good match. But if we, now comes, comes the stellar mass dependency into play when we split this up, we see that there is a clear mismatch and that's for the giant planets. Because our giant planets in, in the sample, in the observed sample, occurs on, in the lower mass stars. And this is exactly where our model doesn't produce any giant planets. The reason is that in the protoplanetary disk of these low mass stars, there's simply not enough material. And if they're more massive, then planet migration is more efficient and the planets would migrate into the star very quickly and disappear. So we cannot form giant planets with the default core accretion mechanism. That's why it was never predicted. It just doesn't work. And now we're finding more and more of these planets above 100 Earth masses, even around the, the very late M dwarfs. Um, so that's a, yeah, that's a kind of a riddle that we had to solve, or at least try solving that. And um, the thing we did next was to put this into context with predictions from other surveys. So here's a histogram in stellar host mass, histogram of um, giant planet occurrence, giant planets per star. And uh, our detections here are in orange, so this is Harps and Carmenas. And then there are the ones from the California Legacy Survey in gray. And there was a previously suggested linear fit to the giant planet occurrence, right? This is dark blue line. And then you can see that there is a clear mismatch to our simulations in light blue. And, and that's basically, yeah, what this shows is that below 0.5 solar masses, we're not forming any giant planets. No matter, not no matter what we do, but um, with our default setup, you know, with the distribution of disk masses informed from disk observations and just our nominal setup, we won't see a single giant planet in the very low mass stars. So we wanted to know, of course, what, what would we have to change in order to um, make it happen? What, what's necessary to form giant planets around these low mass stars? Or, you know, it, it might be that it doesn't work with core accretion, and that's the answer, but we wanted to, you know, push the, the model to the limit and see if we can make it happen. And it turned out that we had to turn on the one knob, and that's 
suppressing planet migration. If we uh, reduce the migration speed and for the express type one migration by a factor of 10, the more massive planets that uh, would otherwise drift towards the star really quickly, uh, they have enough time to reach this runaway gas accretion that makes a you know, 10 Earth mass planet core into a giant planet. Uh, and we get plenty of giant planets even around the, the smaller stars. You need still a sufficient disk mass, but when previously these um, rather massive cores drifted into the star really quickly, now they have the time to reach this threshold, runaway gas accretion threshold. And that's also then when they, the planet opens a gap and it migrates much slower. So now these planets are saved, if you will. The takeaway is maybe that even low mass stars host giant planets. And um, the next question is then what do they do, right? How do they influence the habitability of other planets? It could be that um, this is our interpretation what could cause such a, a suppression of migration rates if these disks are structured, which is something that we don't model in detail right now, then the planet migration would, uh, would happen differently and uh, one could end up with migration traps at these substructures in the disk. So we can look at um, you know, conditional occurrence rates of different planet types that are hosted in the same system. So how likely is it to find a potentially habitable planet in the system that already hosts, for example, a gas giant planet, like a cold Jupiter is what we call them. And the Earth could also be a super Earth. Um, and so in mass period space, you have to, there's of course no consensus what, what is an inner super Earth and what is a cold Jupiter. But here we compared um, our statistics and the synthetic population with observed samples, and they used these limits, which is did the exact same. And what these observational studies found was we found a very interesting. They found an enhanced cold Jupiter occurrence in systems that also have a super Earth. So basically, what that means is that the conditional probability of having a cold Jupiter given a super Earth or Earth in the system is higher than just um, the probability of finding a, a cold Jupiter in any random system. And it also seems to go in, in the other direction as well. So it's more likely to find a super Earth in a cold Jupiter hosting system. So we found that interesting and we were of course wondering um, how are these two different planet types that are so different, how are they influencing each other or do they just you know go back to the same maybe beneficial conditions for planet formation in a specific system so we uh, we did some experiments with our formation model and, and so when these planet types occur together and what what's different in these systems so here i picked a relatively random individual simulation just so that you guys can see what typically happens in this. And, and this is maybe not super representative. This is a, a simulation where more action happens than usually, but I wanted to show you this one because it shows you all the different uh, kind of dynamics that uh, we're seeing and that can have an influence on the final architectures of the system. So this is, uh, this is a video actually once I started this is the planet mass as a function of their orbital distance. And here we injected 100 planetary embryos. We start with lunar mass. And these lines that you see, these are the growth tracks. They're vertical now. But once the planets start migrating, they will turn horizontal at some point. And we also keep track of their ice mass fraction, water ice. Right, so if we start this, we can see what happens relatively quickly, planets will grow. And you see where the ice line is as well, by the way. Growth is much, much stronger here. And uh, a nice system of inner terrestrial planets forms. They start to migrate. They don't grow any much further. But then we have these two giant, oops, yeah, OK. That's the conclusion, basically. Because what happened here is we had um, the formation of two giant planets. And once they interacted, the whole inner system of super-Earth um, got destroyed immediately.
has a good dynamically unstable. You can just watch it one more time. In case you missed it, you have to uh, pay attention to what happens in the inner system because up to now everything is nice and orderly, but then these giant planets interact, became, become dynamically active and disrupt the inner system of Earth and super. So in this case, the giant planet is not beneficial to the occurrence of super. So we saw this often. Um, in the end, our correlation was not uh, a positive one. It was inconclusive, basically. <clears throat> but uh, we found that these planets often form together, the inner super Earth and the outer giants. But then sometimes the outer giants disrupt the inner system. I have a question. So yeah. what was the initial mass, uh, the disk mass? It was over. 10% of this, this stellar mass. Oh, oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, because this was a uh, the 10% is kind of limit with stability, right? Just, this was uh, a relatively massive disk. Yes. Yeah, that's why I said it's not super representative. We have a distribution of disk masses right. that are informed from disk observations uh, and then scaling laws with stellar mass. This is a, a solar it's type system and a rather massive disk because we want to know what happens when giant planets emerge. It has to be sufficient for two giant planets in this case. So yeah, that is um, a rather so massive. So what do you disk. see if it is below 10% compared to like 15%? Well, often we would have no giant planets, but only these, these systems of inner planets. And uh, I will show on one of the next slides how this, the, the systematics of these inner systems uh, changes too. So yeah, planetary systems are wild, but um, oh, something happened here. Uh, Renu has a question. OK. Yeah, Ma Martin, this is uh, very nice uh, animations. Um, this system that you showed is likely an outlier in some, some sense, right? Because it, it's possibly the same question that Serena was asking. Uh, you're producing at the end two rather large giant planets one Jupiter and one 10 Jupiter mass, yeah. right? Which is like a brown dwarf. Right, so, yeah, exactly. So this is an extreme outcome, but it, it shows what can happen if you form both. And then what we were wondering was uh, why um, we see that these planet types tend to form together whenever we get uh, super Earth in the detectable regime. We also get giant planets often, but then later they disappeared, right? So we were wondering, why don't we see this positive correlation like in the observed systems, even though at early times um, we, we, we form planets throughout the system, if the conditions are right. And this is one extreme case. You're absolutely right. This is not um, the typical case, but this is one that shows what, what can happen if these uh, giant planets, first of all, if they grow too massive, and then of course also if they come too close to these inner systems of super Earth. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to show us what the typical case is then? I don't have a video for it, unfortunately, but the statistics of it, that's what I'm going to show you. So okay. everything I'm showing from now, the, the, the distributions, these are not extreme cases, but our nominal um, disk mass and disk size and inner edge distributions that we, that we always use. Okay, thank you. Do you, have, do. Uh, do you plan to have video for the typical system? I should probably put it in with so much demand, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, how does this affect habitability? Well, we're of course interested in, in water content, for example. That's something that we can track in these simulations. Um, so we could look at small planets with and without giant planet companions. And that's what I, I do here. I plot these two groups, everything, everything else is the same, but I just look at the end of the simulation time, which of these systems have detectable Earth or super Earth-sized planets and a giant planet and which have no giant planet companion. We found that on average, these super Earth with a giant companion, they have lower water ice mass fractions than the ones without. And uh, that was interesting. So we wondered how we could test this. Of course, you can um, go into mass radius space where we like to characterize planets, at least the ones where we have uh, size and mass measurements. And uh, you see that these two groups, the inner planets with and without called Jupiters, they occupy different spaces in this um, parameter space. 
which I have in particular. Um, let me just show you what these two diagonal lines uh, mean because this always comes up. Of course, this is something that's very typically uh, a typical output from our simulations that you get these, um, these two distinct compositions, either very dry planets uh, or ones that are uh, volatile rich with uh, water ice mass fractions of up to 50%. So, uh, nowadays, they're often called water worlds, so we, we always got these, a lot of them, like half of the population. Um, but what you notice is that in the group with cold Jupiters, this population is basically completely missing. We don't get any of these water worlds if there is a giant planet in the, in the outer system. And uh, it's even more evident when you look at these, this group of planets with significant atmosphere that's also completely missing in the other um, population. And of course, I would have liked to compare it with the observed sample in order to prove or disprove this prediction of the model, but um, the only available uh, population is the one of super Earth with cold Jupiter, the other one is too contaminated with biases, and so we can compare it only to that subgroup, which does have a good match um, with the corresponding simulated population, but of course this is not, not sufficient to prove or disprove anything. Uh, what we can do is to, you know, open the hood and look into our uh, planet formation model and look into the, the evolution of uh, planets, which, which tracks they went. Uh, and then we found that it actually goes back all the way to the initial conditions of our simulations, uh, in particular disk um, parameters, where the defining parameter was really the solid content of the disks. So this is differently distributed for these two populations, for the super Earth with and without cold Jupiters. Um, you see that these systems that produce inner planets but no outer Jupiters, they started with small to intermediate mass disks, maybe 100 Earth masses or so in solids, and the systems that produced both planet species had a more massive disk. Putting this all together. Yeah, Yes. What do you mean for the solid disk mass? Is that this dust mass? Or? So in our case, this is all planetesimal. Yeah? So this is purely planetesimal accretion based. So we assume a, a continuum uh, of planetesimals from which the planets accrete. We don't track individual planetesimals, but it's a continuum. Uh, and if I say solid disk mass, I mean the whole of this planetesimal disk. So we basically have two cases. Either we have a intermediate mass disk, maybe, as I said, 100 Earth masses or so, in which case, primarily icy, water-rich uh, Earth or super-Earth form, they migrate to detectable distances, and then we end up with systems of volatile-rich planets, low bulk density, and no giant planets. Or in the other case, when we have more massive disks, um, several hundreds of Earth masses, uh, we can now form planetary cores also further in, and they migrate and become drier, um, super Earth with higher density. But now the conditions are also right to form giant planets further out. And once that happens, this would prevent any outer icy planets to migrate to the inner system. And so in the end, we only have these um, high density super Earth and a distant giant planet. That's kind of like the dichotomy in the architectures that we see. Just some takeaways from this part of the talk. We have looked at MDWARF systems and compared simulated planets with those from radio velocity surveys, and we found that there is a good match for rocky planets, but some discrepancies uh, when we look at the giant planets in particular, there is a population of giant planets around and for systems that core accretion theories cannot by default explain. Uh, and our core accretion uh, model also suggests that there is a relation between system architectures and the bulk densities of the planets. In lower mass disks, planets turn uh, out icy, but no giant planets form. And then in more massive disks, we have dry inner uh, terrestrial planets and a giant planet further out. And that, of course, implies the prediction that uh, a rather dense super-Earth is more likely to have a giant planet companion to be tested with future missions. Are there any urgent questions on that part? I don't know 
know if it's urgent, it's definitely a question. Um, so from recent papers about occurrence rate around, of giant planets around M dwarfs, they're getting very, very low numbers of 0.2% or lower. Like, um, can, what is your simulation? How does your simulation compare? Are you getting similar numbers when it comes to? Sorry, simulated giant planets? Uh, yes. Are you, are these, are your simulations capable of efficiently producing giant planets around M dwarfs? Or is it more like, um, uh, what I'm trying to say is, is your simulations over predicting the numbers that we're seeing via observations? Because yeah, that, if, and because that'll affect mm -hmm. how many systems this actually affects, right? Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, of course, the thing is, again, this big question mark in the middle, there are too many open parameters that, that can influence this. And what we did with the planet migration was just artificially suppressing it, right, by a factor of 10. And it does depend on that factor. So it's a tuning parameter, so it's not a, it's not a great situation, but it's difficult to, at the moment, constrain it without a, a large sample of, of disk observations, for example, that show us how many of these low mass disks, which are underrepresented in the observed sample, are actually structured. So how confident can we be that there are these migration traps actually happening? We don't, we don't have a number on this, so it's hard to, to predict. We can, yeah, I can tune the percentage to whatever you like. Unfortunately, this is not great. Good question. Uh, I have a actually urgent. So regarding all these figures, you predict that massively if you try to present uh, I would treat I don't quite sure if you mean to flatter or not, but so to my understanding, so in a model you don't have plant animal. So your solid particle do not drift. So mm -hmm. the reason the super Earth is dry is simply because they form earlier, so they migrate faster into the inner. That's right. It depends on um, depends on when this giant planet forms. If you were somehow able to form an outer ice rich planet and then it migrates inwards before a giant planet forms and it might slip through. But, but it's not because of the pebble are trapped. Okay. No, it's yeah. different. There is no movement of material in the disk. This is purely planetesimal accretion um, based, sure. but pebble accretion models actually, and that, that's interesting because they yeah, could be a different way to do it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but pebble accretion models would actually <laughs> predict an anti-correlation between inner super earth and cold uh, not, not always. Sure. <laughs> yeah, not always, yes, right, yeah. yeah. I wish it was that simple. <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, I might move on because there's a different type of context that I really wanted to cover. And that's this second part. Oops, sorry, that was too fast. And that, uh, that's about the population level imprint of runaway greenhouse climates uh, that could be left on bulk properties such as planet radii or planet bulk densities. Or in other words, we're trying to test if um, we can make the first empirical evidence of that habitable zone concept because that's what the inner edge of the habitable zone is, right? So here I'm showing it in just in a different, with a different x-axis. This time it's really stellar irradiation or installation that these planets receive. Um, and this inner edge uh, that makes um, the, the inner edge definition of that habitable zone is where planets uh, enter a runaway greenhouse. So this is the whole underlying concept that when you have a terrestrial planet with water, there is a, is a radiation limit above which all the surface water evaporates, um, the planet keeps heating up and the atmosphere becomes water dominated. This is called a runaway greenhouse. And again, as a reminder, the habitable zone is of course just a theoretical concept, a very useful one, but there is no empirical evidence for it. So. Uh, we want to see if there are any observational windows into this testing the habitable zone hypothesis and characterizing these runaway greenhouse climates. So to motivate this further, here's a mass radius diagram of well-characterized planets, and we like to compare them with different interior models. And uh, if you're interested in, in the details of this, there is also another origins talk, this time by Terry Ansur. I think it was only two weeks ago or a week ago. And um, 
uh, I mean, she deals more with the experiments that validate these um, uh, these models, but I think that is much needed. So I encourage you to check out that talk as well. Uh, but if we have a runaway greenhouse climate, we would not follow this black solid line that assumes all solid, no water anymore, but the radius of that plant, the transit radius that we would measure will be inflated due to all the steam in that atmosphere. And we use these theoretical predictions as a template to search for population level imprints of this runaway greenhouse threshold that marks the inner edge of the habitable zone. If we could find such an imprint, we could constrain, well, first of all, the fraction of planets that are in runaway greenhouse climates when we observe them, the location of that transition in irradiation space, but also the, the predominant water content of these planets, which is, of course, very interesting for their habitability. And, um, well, you might agree that this is an interesting idea, but the question is, of course, can it be tested and can it be tested in the near future? Or is this just a hypothetical idea that we can prove in a thousand years? Let's see. Um, we could try to translate this into a scientific hypothesis. And our null hypothesis could go like this. Straight line. The average measured radii of the planets in the sample do not depend on the net installation that the planets receive. And note that this is a flipped x-axis here, so that more left you are, the hotter it gets. Um, but if we assume that there is a fixed threshold irradiation above which planets uh, that are volatile rich enter a runaway greenhouse state, then if only a fraction of these plants have some water and form steam atmospheres when we observe them, we would expect a discontinuity in the average planet radius. Of course, the same is true for the bulk density where the radius en enters. And that should be our runaway greenhouse hypothesis. And we're wondering what we see that in the demographics. So here's a bunch of simulated planets randomly drawn from Kepler current rates. And I injected here this, uh, this step function from the slide before. So some of these planets have their radii increased. And I'm asking you, do you see which of these planets are the runaway greenhouse planets? Of course, it's difficult, so I will help you by showing you, first of all, the non-transiting planets, just to show you that it's a lot, and uh, many planets are there but don't transit, but also the original radii of the planets with an increased uh, inflated atmosphere and increased radius. So it's clear for a small sample, it will be difficult to uh, detect such a pattern. Um, so we could try to increase the pattern, maybe 30 planets or so. Is anyone seeing anything yet? Uh, some are still skeptical. Some begin to carefully nod. So, yeah, there might be something in there now, but if there are error bars on top, if you have these detection biases involved, maybe we shouldn't be too confident about it. So let's increase to 500 planets. I think now it's a bit more easy, but uh, we should consider, of course, that not all of these planets will be in the runaway greenhouse climate, even though they are in this hotter regime, right? Some of them might not even have atmospheres, or they don't have volatiles, or they were already in that phase and are completely desiccated by now. So only a fraction of these planets will harbor runaway greenhouse climates. Um, but the point is that the general pattern will remain the same. Even if only a fraction of these planets have increased radii, and here we're using these um, predictions from uh, geophysical models and the predicted radii incre uh, radius in increases, um, uh, but the pattern should be the same, and we call this the habitable zone inner edge discontinuity. <clears throat> so the question I would argue is not whether we could detect such a pattern if it exists. The question is rather what mission do we need in order to test this hypothesis? Yeah? So the goal is to assess uh, uh, exoplanet missions diagnostic power in testing this hypothesis, not just assuming the more planets we can detect, the better. And that's exactly what Bioverse was um, developed for. 
Alex Pixel, who some of you might, might still know him. He was the main developer of Bioverse. Uh, that's an open source tool that allows you to take any mission concept and then instead of just calculating a planet yield, really answering the question, what scientific hypothesis can I test with my mission? Yeah. So we start with generating a stellar sample from Gaia DR3, um, and then we assign planets to these stars that are distributed like the, the Kepler demographics. Um, and then we inject our trend that we're interested in. So in our case, this is the uh, runaway greenhouse or this radius inflation. We check that into that synthetic population. And in the next block of tasks, we simulate our survey that should observe these simulated planets. So here we define uh, sample selection, detection biases, and all that different survey strategies. Um, and in the end, we're equipped to actually test a hypothesis and really uh, answer the question, what hypothesis we can test with the current setup. And then you can play around with that and do mission trades and try out different strategies um, that you would do with your mission. Uh, so it has been applied already to a number of projects. I think the most recent one, Kevin talked about it, maybe last week or very recently. And the paper, his paper is out, so please check it out. But here we're exploring uh, with Bioverse, the ability of exoplanet service to probe this discontinuity at the habitable zone in the ranch. So here's a prototypical detection, I would say. Um, in this case, a high photometric precision, a large sample, uh, and we can fit our runaway greenhouse hypothesis to that. And in red, there are random draws from the posterior that function. And if we have such a large sample and high precision, um, there is a strong detection. So no, no question here, if we compare the Bayesian evidence of that null hypothesis flatland versus this runaway greenhouse hypothesis, uh, there is um, indeed a much better explanation with having such a, a discontinuity. And if we are that lucky, we can look at um, the chances of detecting, detecting this discontinuity as a function of a priori unknown parameters, such as how much water do these plants actually have, right? It's, open, um, or the fraction of planets that actually have a runaway greenhouse. And as long as we find, as long as they have some water and the fraction is not really low, uh, it's actually likely that we will be able to detect this um, runaway greenhouse transition uh, with a large enough sample. And then if we are that lucky, you can go one step further and try an inference of model parameters and constrain them, for example, where in installation space does this transition actually occur? That could be one open parameter or the, the water mass fraction of these planets. And here you can already see uh, that uh, there are some degeneracies. So not all of these parameters can be constrained without additional independent measurements, such as uh, atmospheric abundances of individual planets. But uh, it's a start, we can, uh, we can test when we, uh, when we are able to detect the discontinuity or test if it's there at all. So what mission do we need for that? What kind of mission? Um, what we tried here was we uh, approximated the expected uh, measurement errors and sample configuration of the PLATO mission. It's an upcoming uh, transit mission by ESA. Um, and we let our simulated PLATO mission in different versions observe these simulated systems. And we found that um, for around 100 planets, that seems to be kind of the threshold sample size from which we'll be able to test the hypothesis. Um, and I was curious to, you know, go to that threshold sample size and test different, uh, different service scenarios, different strategies, and then see how well we can for example, here constrain the, the distribution of um, where that threshold installation is. Where is the inner edge of the habitable zone? Right? That's what that is. And uh, what these plots show are um, average posteriors of this threshold installation. And I vertically ordered it by the fraction of plants with greenhouse climates. And then the columns are different service strategies. At the left column, 
we have only the plane Plato mission, only radius measurements, uh, and then in the center, we add to that a radio velocity follow-up program, so we get mass measurements of these planets, and we search for that pattern in bulk density space, where the signal is stronger. And on the right column, we do the exact same, but we focus on only M dwarf systems. And we find that both helps, actually. If you, uh, we need mass measurements, or the signal will be stronger, and we will have better chances of testing it. Um, and we need to have a sufficient M dwarf sample, and that's because we need planets on both sides of the, of the installation threshold, right? Otherwise, we cannot search for, uh, for discontinuity. We need, uh, we need Plato, for example, to uh, deliver with its expected sample size and precision, but also um, a follow-up campaign for mass measurements and a sufficient sample of M dwarf systems would be very helpful. So that brings me to my main conclusions. First, we have looked at m dwarf systems and compared them, compared core accretion theory to observed systems from radio velocity surveys. There is a good match of rocky planets again, and the problem with giant planets, our models also predict a, um, a relation between system architectures and bulk densities of planets, where different initial disk masses lead to different outcomes in the planet architecture. Um, I introduced BioWars, a general hypothesis testing framework to assess the diagnostic power of an emission concept, and we used that to show that there uh, should be a discontinuity in radius and bulk density space that can be detected, and missions like PLEIDO are well suited to constrain this um, habitable zone inner edge discontinuity, and the statistical power of that test will depend, besides these Astro and geophysical unknowns will depend on the planet yield of the mission, but also for how many planets we can get mass measurements and how large the fraction of M dwarf planets in the sample is. Thanks a lot. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, questions. Maybe I missed, but in your core creation model in the first part of the talk, did you include the have a creation because you mentioned it's not enough mass for the giant planets. But how about you include the have a creation? Will that mass be enough to form all these giant planets? Yeah, that's a good question. So we have only planetesimal accretion in our solid. So that's that's all we do in the Baron model. But um, there is one paper where we did a comparison with the sa everything the same but pebble accretion only. And then I think they switched Pebble and Planetesimal Accretion on and look what happened. Brugge et al, maybe 2020, I'm not sure. Yeah. Where you see the differences. Thank you. So there is a question in chat, Evo Mendes. Um, do all greenhouse planets need to have inflated atmospheres? Is Venus a counterexample? Venus is not a counterexample, but it would count to that population of planets that are within that regime but don't have inflated steam atmospheres. Uh, we think that um, Venus used to have a water ocean and that all that water is already desiccated. So uh, that's one of the examples where we're too late observing the system, right? Mm -hmm. There would have been a chance probably to see it with an inflated radius, but we're too late. So that's what we um, just um, marginalize over with our with our dilution factor, this fraction of planets that actually have runaway greenhouse climate. So no, not all planets that are in that hotter regime actually have a runaway greenhouse. That would make it much easier, but that's not what nature gives us. So Abel, if you have more questions, please uh, uh, unmute and then ask. Um, is that good so far? Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. Yes, that's my question, thank you. Um, uh, I, I was wondering, um, so with the Bioverse simulation, um, I was curious whether you've considered using like um, a, a like installation dependent fraction of planets that would have a runaway greenhouse and then using actually like how close uh, you'd expect the Plato detections to be because I imagine that the closer a planet is to its star, 
the less long lived the runaway greenhouse state would be because the atmosphere would, you know, go away faster. Um, but I don't, I don't have any idea of whether that would be like an end effect that would only matter for very close in planets and how many Plato would actually detect in that or if it would be more important for the whole population. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea for basically a, a second order hypothesis, right? Not just a flat line and a step function. There are many ways of uh, making the, the model more complicated, but given the data that we have, or the data that we expect, of course, we're trying to come up with the, the, the most simple possible uh, explanation, of course, just uh, say, uh, good old Occam's razor stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, and we're already avoiding these very hot plants where we know that no atmosphere can survive for very long. We're not even going into that regime. There are a lot of, you know, as you know, very hot planets um, where we wouldn't expect steam atmospheres. Oh, okay, so that Plato detections that you said, that those are planets that are like already exterior to that like very, very hot regime where you wouldn't be able to see anything or? Yeah, exactly. So oh, okay, what we, cool. and, well, here we, we just took the, the default Plato sample, but we could probably um, get, uh, get a detection or a non-detection, a test, a significant test yeah. with a smaller sample. If we would tailor that Plato sample to, you know, it's just populating both sides of the habitable zone in the edge neatly, mm -hmm. which is not what's going to happen because this is not the only uh, question Plato is trying to answer, but that's something that could be done. And that's something uh, where Bioverse is great at trying out these things, you know, what if we, we change this with the mission? Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, any other question? Another question from Zoom audience. Okay, let's, let's uh, thank Martin, and we'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>